proud of its own identity and language, Catalonia is one of Spain's most highly industrialized regions and also one of the most independent minded. With a distinct history stretching back to the early Middle Ages, many Catalans think of themselves as a separate nation from the rest of Spain. A roughly triangular region in Spain's far northeast corner, Catalonia is separated by the Pyrenees Mountains from southern France, with which it has close historical and cultural ties. Most of the region's population lives in Barcelona, its vibrant political and economic hub and popular European travel destination, with tourism an important part of Catalonia's economy. That said, Catalonia is Spain's economic powerhouse and its demand for independence has sent parts of Europe into panic mode. On the streets of Edinburgh and Glasgow, the Scottish saltire flag has flown alongside the Catalan colours in recent weeks as pro-independence supporters offer solidarity from the far corners of Europe. Whether it's the Basque Country, Catalonia, Scotland and then going elsewhere to Palestine, to Kurdistan, they all have the right to exist as nations. Spain said absolutely no way, we're not even going to give that vote and what we've actually seen is just the international community has rallied behind Spain and said look, we're not going to upset these rules. Breakaway movements across Europe are eyeing Catalonia's fate. Analysts say the EU is seeking to avoid further splintering, just as the bloc battles to overcome Brexit and the migrant crisis. Studies reveal that one in five Spaniards and Portuguese has a Jewish ancestor, while a tenth of Iberians boast North African ancestors. Being Western Europeans, it's no surprise that the most common Y-DNA haplogroup among Catalans is a branch of the R1B haplogroup. That said, Catalans also share a very high degree of genetic affinity with the neighboring Basque people a population that is considered, in anthropological terms, the most indigenous people in Europe, the direct descendants of Cro-Magnon, and as such, the first modern humans to inhabit Europe and among the highest percentages of Rh negative blood found anywhere in the world. There are many different blood groups, of which the two most important are the ABO and the rhesus, or Rh groupings. More than 85% of the world's population possess the Rh antigen in their blood and are considered Rh positive. In all other individuals, the antigen is lacking and they are classified as Rh negative. Should the antigen enter the bloodstream of an Rh negative person, serious consequences follow. If a Rh negative woman is impregnated by a Rh positive man, the fetus may be Rh positive too. If the Rh antigen enters the maternal bloodstream via the placenta, it induces the woman to produce anti-Rh antibodies, which could attack subsequent Rh-positive fetuses, causing jaundice and possibly death. Treatment in such cases is to transfuse the baby immediately after birth with Rh-negative blood. Sequenced uh, the genome of a 37,000 year old individual from Europe, meaning it's one of the oldest modern humans found in Europe. And uh, this genome basically reveals three different things. First of all, and this is very surprising, we can see that all the major genetic components present in, in, in living day Europeans were already present in Europeans. 37,000 years ago. And that changes the whole concept of how Europe was populated, where we previously thought, well, it was massive movements of people from outside into Europe providing genes. Now it is, it, it, the data suggests, no, there was like this major population of people stretching all the way from Europe to Central Asia, exchanging genes in a very complex network with each other. Since successfully sequencing the modern human genome of several different human races, geneticists have determined that all non-Africans have roughly 1 to 5% DNA from Neanderthals. 
Now, using saliva tests, scientists have found that another different non-human species contributed genetic material to the ancestors of black Africans living in sub-Saharan Africa today. The research adds to a growing body of evidence suggesting that sexual rendezvous between different archaic hominin species were common and the reason for the various ethnic and racial groups we have today. Past studies have concluded that the forebears of modern humans in Asia and Europe interbred with other early hominin species including Neanderthal and Denisovans and now this new research is among more recent genetic analysis indicating that ancient Africans also had trysts with other hominins not considered part of the modern human species. Dr. Omer Gokerman, PhD, Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of Buffalo College of Arts and Sciences, says, and I quote, it seems that the interbreeding between different early hominin species is not the exception, it's the norm. Our research traced the evolution of an important protein that is found in saliva, he says. When we looked at the history of the gene that codes for the protein, we see the signature of archaic admixture in modern-day sub-Saharan African populations. The research was published on July 21, 2017 in the journal Molecular Biology and Evolution, and the study found that a group of genomes from sub-Saharan Africa had a version of the gene that was wildly different from versions found in other modern humans. The sub-Saharan variant was so distinctive that Neanderthal and Denisovan genes matched more closely with those of modern humans than the sub-Saharan did. Professor Gockman goes on to say that, and I quote, based on our analysis, the most plausible explanation for this extreme variation is archaic introgression the introduction of genetic material from a ghost species of ancient hominins. This ghost human relative could be a species that has not been discovered, such as a subspecies of Homo erectus or an undiscovered hominin. We call it a ghost species because we do not have the fossils. End of quote. Scientists have made a shocking discovery. Many modern-day humans are walking around carrying archaic DNA. Those of European or Asian descent, roughly 1 to 5 percent of their genome comes from Neanderthals. So we are Neanderthals. In special clean labs like this one at UC Santa Cruz, scientists can extract Neanderthal DNA from tiny bits of fossilized bone. It is an amazing thing that we can get DNA out of our ancestors that are now extinct. Professor Ed Green runs the Paleogenomics Lab. He says advances in technology allow experts to quickly sift through and locate ancient DNA. We have fantastically fast machines. How did this mashup occur? Chalk it up to prehistoric hanky-panky. We carry traces of these encounters in our DNA. And they affect our health in, in many different ways. Some Neanderthal and Denisovan genes boost our immune systems and protect against infections. Others increase the risk of depression, skin problems, allergies, blood clots, even diabetes. A few unusual variants help some of us adapt to extreme environments. It could be the high altitude in Tibet, or it could be the very cold environment around the Arctic. Professor Rasmus Nielsen at UC Berkeley headed up a study that discovered how modern Tibetans carry a gene from these archaic humans. It regulates the molecule that carries oxygen in the blood and allows Tibetans to survive more than three miles above sea level. When they breathe, they only get about 60% as much oxygen. Professor Svante Pebo is a founder of the field of paleogenomics. He and his team have sequenced the entire Neanderthal genome. As to why? We want to find out more about our origins and our history. Neanderthals were once considered brutes, clumsy and stupid. Remember those Geico commercials? So easy a caveman could do it? I think that view is really changing. Back in Gibraltar, meet Nana and Flint, forensic reconstructions of a female and child Neanderthal found here. We now know our ancient relatives had a sophisticated culture, adorned themselves with feathers, buried their dead, and as seen in one cave, even etched art. Suddenly, they disappeared. 
Now that scientists have the complete Neanderthal genome, they want to look for all genetic changes in modern day people. Changes that might hold the clues as to why we survived. Hybrid animals have long existed in the imagination, from the beast of Greek mythology to the creations of modern day science fiction. But they also exist in real life in some rather unusual combinations and in some rather intimidating ones as well, as Vicki Mabry now reports. This big guy is a liger. Yes, a liger. 900 pounds and 12 feet tall. He's a gigantic kid because he's a liger. Father lion, mother tiger makes him... Father is a lion, mother is a tiger. Makes him the liger. Oh. Oh. There's a good boy. Good boy. For all you non-believers, they really do exist. What are you drawing? A liger. As we learn from the film Napoleon Dynamite. What's a liger? It's pretty much my favorite animal. It's like a lion and a tiger mixed. Redford's skills and magic. The Napoleon Dynamite phenomenon made an awareness about ligers, which made people have an interest in the natural world. It made a unicorn come to life. Unicorns are mythical, but hybrid animals are very real. What is a mule, if not a combination of the horse and the donkey? Very common. But a liger? He's got these stripes and spots that are all over him that some young lions have, but they fade away. In him, he has more of a tiger pattern to his head of stripes that's got some spotting in the middle of it. He, he has, doesn't have a mane. He doesn't so. have a mane. It's more like a tiger. But uh, in, in many ways, he is just kind of 50-50, and it's a blend. It's not one trait and another added together. These mixes happen naturally, Doc says, not through artificial insemination naturally in a nature preserve, but not typically in the wild. In the wild, lions and tigers don't cross territory, so it's not a thing that there are wild ligers, although there are many wild hybrids. Wild wolfins have happened, where there are whales and dolphins. Wait a minute, a wolfin? The Sea Life Park in Hawaii is home to what they believe is the only known wolfin in the world. Keikaimalu is the daughter of a false killer whale and a bottlenose dolphin. And there are more. The Kama. One half camel, one half llama. The wolf dog. That one's pretty obvious. And the beefalo. The combination of a buffalo and a cow. And these are the shapely striped legs of a zebra, right? Nope. This is a zorse, half zebra, half horse. This is just a mule of a different color. Boyd Biggs raises zorses and zonkeys, or z-donks, combination zebra and donkey, outside Fort Worth, Texas. He breeds and trains these unusual looking creatures for riding and working around his ranch. Conventional mules helped build this country. And, and everybody's used to the idea of a conventional mule. It's a sterile animal that can't reproduce. It has no impact on the gene pool. They may not reproduce, but there's still the issue of ethics and evolution. How do these hybrids fit into the natural order? Each species is, you know, the end result of millions and millions of years of evolution, organisms that are shaped, again, by their environment. George Amato is an evolutionary geneticist at the American Museum of Natural History. Hybrids that are created between good species because humans bring them together and let them reproduce do not fit into the natural order. Is he a freak of nature? I don't consider them a freak at all because it's a naturally occurring process. But why create these exotic species? Antel views them as wildlife ambassadors. Hybrids have a place. In present day, their real place is awe and wonder which I hope leads to an interest in the natural world. The liger is a hybrid cross between a male lion and a female tiger. Female ligers are not sterile, but rather they are highly fertile. A female liger can reproduce with both a lion and a tiger. Therefore, it's incorrect to associate sterility with ligers. That said, humanity is a hybrid species and though the child mortality rate was much higher thousands of years ago, viable offspring survived and the hybridization process which created modern man still takes place today. 
My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an independent anthropologist. Please consider making a donation to Atlantean Gardens, the nonprofit organization that helps make these educational videos possible and that publishes my books on Amazon.com. Thank you to those who share these presentations. I rely on word of mouth and appreciate all of the positive feedback. So leave a comment, share, and I will see you next time.